Hello, and welcome to Western Civ, episode 264, Copernicus, part one. Quote, My lord, most reverend father in Christ, my noble lord, with due expression and respect and deference, I have received your most reverend lordship's letter. Again, you have deigned to write me with your own hand, conveying an admonition at the outset. In this regard, I most humbly ask your most reverend lordship not to overlook the fact that the woman about whom your most reverend lordship writes to me was given in marriage through no action or plan of mine. But this is what happened. Considering that she had once been my faithful servant, with all my zeal and energy, I endeavored to persuade them to remain with each other as respectable spouses. I would venture to call on God as my witness in this matter, and they would admit that if they were both interrogated. But she complained that her husband was impotent, a condition which she acknowledged in court as well as outside. Hence, my efforts were in vain. However, with reference to the matter, I will admit to your lordship that when she was recently passing through here from the fair with the woman from Elberg who employs her, she remained in my house until the next day. But since I realize the bad opinion of me arising therefrom, I shall so order my affairs that nobody will have any proper pretext to suspect evil of me thereafter, especially on account of your most reverend lordship's admonition and exhortation. I want to obey you gladly in all manners, and I should obey you out of desire that my service may always be acceptable. This is a letter written by Nicholas Copernicus, the father of modern astronomy and one of the major catalysts of the scientific revolution. For those who picture their icons as statues, as, let's just say, chapters and textbooks, as unblemished, it's jarring. It would be perhaps less startling if Copernicus had been a young man when he wrote this letter. Even icons, I suppose, are allowed indiscretions when they're young. But he wasn't young. He was 58 years old when he drafted this letter in July of 1531. The background facts of the matter are that Copernicus had a housekeeper whose identity we do not know. In the 1520s, who left his employment to marry. The woman soon separated from her husband, supposedly, as Copernicus says, because he was impotent, and then went to work as a housekeeper for a widow in the city of Elblag, which was about 20 miles southwest of Copernicus's home in Fromborg. On one occasion, as the two women were returning from a fair, they decided to stop at Copernicus's town and spend the night. The ex-housekeeper stayed at the astronomer's house. Someone then reported the visit to Copernicus's supervisor, who sent a letter rebuking him, because he's a member of the clergy. This letter was Copernicus's response. Now, this is not the first such correspondence between Copernicus and his bishop, Maurice Farber. And the subject had been then what it was now, a woman. Notably, a woman living with Copernicus a member of a local canon, at a time when the church was really cracking down on such behavior. I wanted to start with this letter because it's a, such a stark reminder of the reality that the men and women from history were real people with a lot on their minds. We know that Copernicus was the father, really, of heliocentric theory of the universe, but clearly he had a lot more going on. This was not the only unique aspect to Copernicus's life. He was what we would call a late bloomer. He did not attend university until he was 19 years old, during an age when most young men went starting at age 15. It took him three universities and 12 years to obtain his degree when the standard length of study was only four years. Copernicus never dreamt of glory. He wasn't even what we would say a professional astronomer. He was, instead, as we'll see, a man who was willing to question the wisdom of the ancients. He was the man that many credit with beginning 
the scientific revolution. When we're done here, I might argue that point, but it certainly has some validity. During the past few episodes, we have covered the scientific revolution rather broadly. Today, we start to focus more closely on one thinker, one aspect of the scientific revolution. We're going to begin with Copernicus because he is just simply the most logical beginning. Again, there's a very good argument to be made that we should not be beginning with Copernicus. There's a few other names that predate him, which I am going to give you in the context of the story. But I think to continue going back, always looking for the source is a fool's errand when it comes to history. Eventually, we'll just wind up in Mesopotamia. It's just kind of the end game, no matter what we do. Then again, if you're still listening to this show, our 10,000 or whatever it is we're at, I'm guessing you know that already. The publication of Copernicus's manuscript started the scientific revolution in the spring of 1543. But the first step to the road on that seminal event was taken in a wood-paneled classroom at the University of Vienna, nearly a century earlier, the spring semester of 1454. The course taught in that room in an old building surveyed the latest thinking on theoretical astronomy. It brought together an inventive humanities professor named George Purbach and an 18-year-old student who would be galvanized by the lectures and would quickly become the professor's research and observation partner. His name was Johannes Mueller, but history doesn't know him by that name. He actually goes by a Latin name, Regio Montanus, which means King's Mountain, a reference to his birthplace. And he would soon surpass his mentor as the greatest astronomer of the 15th century. While neither Purebach nor Reggio Montanus knew it, the timing of this astronomy class could not have been better. The Renaissance had begun in northern Italy. In 1453, the Ottoman Turks had sacked Constantinople, and a flood of Greek manuscripts poured into the West. In 1455, Johann Gutenberg produced his Bible. All the stars, pun intended, were aligned for something to pop. Frankly, the only reason that today we don't know these two men, Reggio Montanus and Purbach, more as the fathers of modern astronomy is that both of them were going to die at quite a young age. Purbach dies at 38, Reggio Montanus at age 40. Yet to be fair to Copernicus, I want to be clear that these men might have become the fathers of modern astronomy had they lived. Neither that we know of was really rethinking the Ptolemaic system of geocentrism at the time that they died. Thus, to guess that they would have at some point challenged that notion is just that. Guessing. George Pierbach is an interesting case because he wasn't even supposed to be thinking about astronomy, letting alone teaching a course on the subject. He was hired by the University of Vienna in 1453 as a humanities professor. He was supposed to teach Horace and the Aeneid, as well as a class on rhetoric. The young intellectual also wrote poetry in Latin, some of the best from this era. Yet beginning in 1451, when he recorded his first observations of the heavens, Pierbach became fascinated with astronomy and astrology. He convinced the university to allow him to teach a course on astronomy just one year after his appointment as a professor. There's no record of Pierbach ever taking a formal course on the subject, so it appears that he was entirely self taught. The major astronomy textbook in the period was called A Theory of the Planets, written by Gerard of Cremona. Purbach used it, but he was well aware of its deficiencies. Gerard of Caroma's text was based entirely on the source for all astronomical thinking at the time, which was 
Ptolemy's Almagest. Ptolemy, who lived between 85 and 165 Common Era, was a Greek who lived in the Egyptian city of Alexandria. Certainly, he was a scholar of what we would say prodigious talent today. He was ingenious and prolific for the time. He wrote several critical works, including Almagest, which surveyed everything known about the universe and the study of it at the time. It included tables for locating heavenly bodies, which most astrologers coveted. The arrangement described within the pages of the Almagest was based on Aristotle's conception of the cosmos. The Earth was at the center. It did not move. It was believed that if the Earth did move, the atmosphere itself would blow away. And since it clearly was not blowing away, just as clearly the Earth must be standing perfectly still. All of the planets, which included the moon and the sun, revolved around the Earth, and they did so in perfect circles, at constant speed, and in the same plane. The planet closest to the Earth was the moon. Next closest was Mercury, followed by Venus and the sun. Then Mars, Jupiter, and finally Saturn. Neptune and Uranus, by the way, were not discovered until after the invention of the telescope. The sun and the moon were considered unique, but the five other planets were referred to as quote-unquote wandering stars. That's because they moved through the night sky or wandered. The word planet is actually derived from the Greek word for wanderer. The wandering stars were viewed against fixed stars, which were all the other illuminated objects in the sky. The fixed stars, of course, also moved around the Earth, but they always maintained their position relative to one another. So it was believed that the fixed stars were attached to celestial sphere that marked the outer boundary of the universe, just beyond Saturn. And this sphere rotated around the Earth on a celestial axis once a day. The wandering stars were always seen in a thin band on the dark horizon, which meant that only a few constellations of fixed stars served as their background. The 12 special constellations were called the Houses of the Zodiac, which means circuit or circle. Ptolemy's model of the universe was founded on Aristotle's dictates, coupled with what that Alexandrian knew about the actual behavior of the heavenly bodies based on years of his own careful observation. A troubling difficulty that he had to explain was called retrograde motion. The concept that the wandering stars, what we know as the planets, during their annual rotation around the Earth, appeared to stop and then actually go in reverse before stopping again and then resuming their proper course. Ptolemy cleverly solved this mystery. In his conception, the planets revolved around the Earth by being attached to one of two spheres. Each planet had two spheres. The main sphere, the one that had the Earth at its center, was always called the deferent. The second, smaller sphere, to which the planet was attached, was called the epicycle. The epicycle revolved around a point on the deferent. So the construct was a sphere whose center was on the edge of a much larger sphere. So the way you have to imagine this is a series of planes or circles. So the big circle, that's where all the planets are rotating around the Earth, in theory, including the Sun. But then on that line, on that circle, each planet has its own smaller circle that continues to spin. So that's how you explain retrograde motion. So, and still keep, you know, geocentrism. But there were two other big problems. First, Ptolemy's observations made him sure that the Earth wasn't quite the precise center of the universe. So he created a point close to the Earth, and he called it the eccentric. The eccentric was the center of all the planetary deference, the big circles. Second, the planets did not move at a constant uniform speed either, as Aristotle suggested that they should have. This problem was solved by adding a final piece to the puzzle. On the other side of the eccentric, the center point, exactly opposite the Earth, and at the same distance 
from the eccentric was another point that was called the equant. The equant, that is equalizing point, was the point around which the planet revolved at a uniform speed. So the deferent and the epicycle address the problem of retrograde motion, and the eccentric and equant address the problems of locating the true center of revolution and non-uniform speed. But a planet revolved around the eccentric at a uniform distance, not a uniform speed. Likewise, a planet moved with uniform speed along the equant, but not a uniform distance. One scholar at the time remarked, quote, Ptolemy broke sharply away from previous requirement that circular motion must be uniform around its own center, end quote. This break would deeply trouble Copernicus. Now, of course, all of this is sort of heavy ancient science, and I gave you a bunch of terms there. And to a large extent, I'm not going to refer to equance and deference because I think it's too confusing. But I wanted to give you a short overview of the Ptolemaic system so that you at least understood to some extent what everybody was criticizing. Again, I think the easiest way to understand it are circles within circles. So if you picture one big circle around the Earth with everything rotating, and then individual circles on that, sort of like if you had a carousel, and on that carousel, each individual horse was also on its own circular carousel, so that they were at one point moving further and closer to the center of the carousel as they moved around it. That's probably the easiest way to picture it. All of these qualifications in Ptolemaic geocentric model caused King Alfonso of Castile, who was the sponsor of a new table compiled in the 13th century, and which would be the standard source for locating planet and star positions during Copernicus's time, to quip, eh, probably apocryphally, we don't know that he actually said this, but according to him, he said, quote, if the Lord Almighty had consulted me before embarking upon creation, I should have recommended something simpler, end quote. And I think that's the best criticism that anybody ever gave prior to Copernicus of the Ptolemaic system. It might work, but it was hopelessly, hopelessly complicated. Ptolemy's universe was much, much more complicated than Aristotle's, but it had advantages that if you didn't look too closely, and worked, or at least it seemed to work. The first hurdle for early astronomers was just data. There simply wasn't enough data from which you could start to question the old system. You needed charts and tables showing the location of stars, and they had to be accurate, or I suppose accurate enough, to begin to draw some conclusions. And that's where Pure Bach and Regiomontanus come in. Regiomontanus, born in 1436, was a genuine child prodigy. He was the son of a miller, but sent to the University of Leipzig in 1447 at the age of only 11. The boy studied there for three years, after which time he enrolled at the University of Vienna. The young Regiomontanus was already constructing complicated astronomical tables even before arriving in Vienna at 1450. So he jumped at the chance to take Pure Bach's new class on astronomy. Regio Montanus's astute observations and questions led Pierre Bach to quickly understand that he had more than just a gifted student sitting before him. He had a partner. From this point on, they became colleagues and partners in astronomical observations, despite the fact that Regio Montanus was 13 years younger than Pierre Bach. The next few years were a whirlwind of activity. It almost seems as if Pierre Bach had a premonition of his impending death because he accomplished a tremendous amount in a short period of time. He and Regio Montanus made a number of accurate astronomical observations together. Pierre Bach built dozens of well-crafted instruments, such as astrolabs and sundials, and he formulated innovative trigonometric tables. Most importantly, he wrote two of the most important works of the 15th century. First, he refined his lecture notes from his 1454 course to produce the new theory of the planets in manuscript form. The actual innovations in Purebeck's text were minor. However, by correcting certain errors and simplifying parts of Ptolemy's model, Purebeck's text marked a significant improvement 
over Gerard of Cremona's, which was overly complicated and full of mistakes. Second, he created the Table of Eclipses in 1459, which accurately projected lunar and solar eclipses for many decades ahead and became a sort of must-have reference for astronomers or astrologers. The tables consisted of approximately 100 dense pages of careful calculations. Future astronomers and astrologers were saved hours of painful mathematics because of him. In addition, Pierre Bach wrote annual astronomical yearbooks, I guess like farmer's almanacs, that projected the movement of the sun, the moons, and the planets for any given year. Pierre Bach also definitely practiced astrology. And this is a crucial point that I want to make. There was no distinction between astronomy and astrology in science pecking order at this point in history. In fact, Pierre Bach was the court astrologer to the King of Hungary for a period of time. But then in 1461, Pierre Bach fell ill. On his deathbed, he begged Regio Montanus to continue their work. Regio Montanus agreed, of course. How could he say no to his dying mentor? And pass away, Pierre Bach did, at the age of 38 in April 1461. So now it was all up to Regio Montanus. Regio Montanus essentially inherited Pierre Bach's number one patron, the guy who had been footing the bill for all this astronomical research, Cardinal Bessarion. Six months after Pierre Bach's death, Regio Montanus left the University of Vienna and accompanied the good cardinal back to Rome. Their relationship was doubly important to Regio Montanus because Bessarion taught him Greek. Now he was a gifted mathematician and astronomer who could read the original Ptolemy and Aristotle. In 1462, Regio Montanus finished Pure Bach's work, The Epitome of Almagest. It was not published until 1496. One of the things you're going to notice here is how early on there's this huge disconnect between when a work was finished and when it was published. Certainly, this delay made scientific progress early on much slower than it could have been. Still, the book was hugely important. Not only did Regio Montanus write in Latin, thereby exposing a wide range of Europeans to Ptolemy for the first time, but he augmented his translation with commentary and new tables of observations. In 1467, Regio Montanus too traveled to the Hungarian court to join the staff of the Royal Library. While in Hungary, Regio Montanus completed several more works in trigonometry that were actively used in the early 16th century. The most important was titled The Tables of Directions, which was printed in 1490. The tables helped to determine the positions of heavenly bodies based on the perceived daily rotation of the night sky. The work was used as astrologers were trying to determine the houses of the zodiac. It would be one of the first books owned by Copernicus. In 1471, Regio Montanus packed up his instruments, manuscripts, and other personal belongings and moved to Nuremberg. He explained his reasons to a correspondent. Quote, Quite recently, I have made observations in the city of Nuremberg, for I have chosen it as my permanent home, not only on account of the availability of instruments, particularly the astronomical instruments on which the entire science is based, but also on account of the great ease of all sorts of communication with learned men living everywhere, since this place is regarded as the center of Europe because of the journeys of merchants, end quote. Once there, Regio Montanus was befriended by one of those rich merchants, a man by the name of Bernard Walther. Walther became his patron and student and paid for the construction of one of his first formal astronomical observatories in Europe. It was built outside the protective walls to the northeast on a rise above the city. Upon its completion, the two set out on one of the most ambitious astronomical observation programs in history, and certainly the boldest ever taken up to that point. Regio Montanus's plan for reforming astronomy consisted of two parts. The first was new observations. The second was the publication of important works in mathematics and astronomy. As with the observatory, Walther provided the funds necessary 
for the now legendary astronomer to start the first publishing operation devoted to the production of mathematical and scientific works. His second published work was probably the most popular, called The Ephemerides. This appeared in 1474, and it accurately projected the positions for celestial bodies for every single day from January the 1st, 1475, to December 31st, 1506. The main purpose of this book was to assist in astrological readings. The book became even more legendary when it was later reported that Columbus, who traveled with a copy on his voyages, was able to frighten the hostile natives of Jamaica by relying on Reggio Montanus to predict a lunar eclipse on February the 19th, 1504, which, if you'll recall from several years ago, we did discuss in our chapters on Columbus. Not only did Reggio Montanus want to get important works into print, he was also just as serious about having them published well. He recognized that there were unique challenges to publishing mathematical books. These were difficult works to set because of the need to include numerous diagrams and often elaborate tables. Not only must the pages be clear and legible, but they had to be free of error, so accuracy became paramount. Yet these were precisely the kinds of titles inherently prone to errors. Consider this following quotation from Reggio Montanus. For if I am not mistaken, we are sinning when we obscure the opinions of noble authors by contaminating them with our own ignorance and infecting posterity with erroneous copies of books. For who does not realize that the admirable art of printing recently devised by our countrymen is harmful to men if it multiplies erroneous works as it is useful when it publishes properly corrected editions? Perhaps because Reggio Montanus was so careful, he did not succeed in getting many works published before he died in 1476. Reggio Montanus, by late in his life, had become a very difficult person to work with. He had a huge ego and was absolutely a genius, as we would consider the term today. He had no hesitation whatsoever in identifying inferior scholars in print, which to him was just about everyone. In 1475, Reggio Montanus was summoned to Rome by Pope Sixtus IV to assist in the reform of the calendar. One of the most important uses of astronomy was for creating accurate calendars. By the late 15th century, everyone knew that the calendar in use, the Julian calendar, had grown terribly inaccurate, and it was becoming embarrassing for the church as it sought to identify the proper Sunday for Easter and other holy days. The church still insisted on observing Easter on the first Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox, so you had to have astronomical precision to figure all this stuff out. Reggio Montanus left in the summer and died one year later on July the 6th, 1476, while still in Rome. He was only 40 years old and had left Nuremberg in perfect health. There are two theories about his death. The first and most likely is that he died from plague, which recurred that year in and around Rome. The second is more sensational. He was rumored to have been murdered by the two sons of George Trezebond, whom Reggio Montanus had scathingly criticized in print for being a flawed mathematician and astronomer. Either way, it was a horrible end for one of the greatest minds in history. Certainly, I'm sure there were many in Europe who thought Reggio Montanus's successor would be fast in coming, but he wasn't. In fact, the gifted human who would succeed Reggio Montanus was only an infant when Reggio Montanus was publishing his works in Nuremberg. On February 19th, 1473, in the town of Turin, then in the Hanseatic League, on the north coast of what is today much of Germany and Poland, Mikoja Kaparnik was born. 
we know him by his Latinized name, Copernicus. Nicholas Copernicus lived and spent most of his adult life in what we would say today is a very unusual region for producing scientists. The Baltic region of northwestern Poland was, in Copernicus's time, known as Prussia. It was a territory roughly traced by a triangle, formed by major cities of Gansk to the northwest, Torun to the southwest, and Krolekst to the northeast as the main focal points. These were sizable cities, and in between them were gently rolling hills, forests, fertile farmlands, streams, ponds, and countless small towns and villages. Forming the northern border of our triangle is the Baltic Sea. The territory had been fought over many times in history. It's going to be fought over in World War II. It will be fought over by Napoleon. Yet it still bears the unmistakable mark from the people who first built its first permanent structures and towns in the region. And those were, of course, the Teutonic Knights. If you're interested in learning more about the Teutonic Knights, I did an entire deep dive episode on my Patreon page. You can check that out. Link is in the show notes. It's one of the many bonus episodes that dives deep into a different aspect that we don't cover in the relative narrative of the show. And But sort of in general, the Teutonic Knights were one of the military orders. So you think of them in the same sort of vein as the Knights Hospitaller and the Knights Templar. Instead of trying to conquer the Holy Land, they were in charge of trying to Christianize one of the few remaining pagan enclaves in Europe, which was in the Baltic Sea region, in today what we would call Lithuania, Estonia, um, and also parts of Poland. And they were very successful in doing so. And they were actually very successful in establishing their own state. The Teutonic Knights actually were able to develop a sizable kingdom for themselves that they sort of cut out of what was today parts of Germany and mostly parts of Poland as well as Lithuania. However, the Teutonic Knights are decisively defeated by a joint Lithuanian-Polish army later on, so by Copernicus's time, they're a distant memory. Copernicus's ancestors were native Germans who migrated east in the 13th century. They originally settled in the province of Silesia in western Poland. From there, the family moved to Krakow, in the middle of the 14th century. There they became successful merchants. Copernicus's father, also named Nicholas, left Krakow for the smaller city of Turin in the late 1450s. As I mentioned before, in 1466, the Prussians and Poles finally and decisively defeated the Teutonic Knights. And so, per the terms of the treaty, Turin was to be incorporated in the Kingdom of Poland. Copernicus was the youngest of four children. The Copernicus family was extremely well off when baby Nicholas joined. Nicholas Sr. was at least 45 years old, and probably closer to 50. The family and its servants lived in a spacious, three-story townhouse, which it had inherited from Copernicus's mother's father. The structure was built around the year 1350 and was located near the center of town. It had an elaborate design brick facade, with large windows facing a narrow cobblestone street. We know there was a courtyard in the rear, high ceilings, murals, and expensive furniture, which would have made it very comfortable for the time. It was well heated with fireplaces throughout. Seven years later, Nicholas Sr., having grown in wealth and prestige, moved his family into an even larger, more impressive house. The new home was located right on the town square. The family also owned a vineyard, and other properties outside the city walls. There is no doubt that Copernicus and his brother and sisters led privileged lives. Turin itself, in terms of the town, lies beside the Vistula River, which flows into the Baltic Sea about 100 miles to the north of the city. By the late 15th century, Turin was a thriving market town with around 10,000 inhabitants. Sadly for Nicholas and his family, when he was about 10 years old, his father died. Fortunately, Nicholas's uncle, Lucas Wazentrobe, was already becoming well-established in the hierarchy of the church. 
1489, he would be elected Bishop of Warmia in the northeast corner of modern-day Poland. It would be from that position that Uncle Lucas would be able to support Nicholas and his older brother. Note, the sisters were quickly married off. At this stage of his life, there's no indication that Nicholas was destined for anything other than life as a merchant. He would live like his father and his grandfather before him. We do not have any idea of what motivated him to start gazing toward that night sky. We'll leave it there for now and pick it up next week as we continue to follow Copernicus as he attends university and begins to develop an interest in astronomy. In the meantime, if you're interested in additional content, there's a series of links in the show notes that you can check out that provide the opportunity to both support the show and what we're doing, as well as to get bonus content that will fill your days until the next Western Civ episode. 